I always forget that. We are recording now. I just have one comment, and I know it was stated at the meeting, <clears throat> but I think we should note it in the minutes um, where it talks about, I'm sorry, I didn't have it in front of me before. Um, when we talked about the searching for DVDs in Z39.50, there is no keyword field in that, in the Z39.50. I know there was mention of it, but. Got um, it. I don't and want people to be confused if they look at the minutes and then. I see. So, Oh, this part, advise be careful when you're searching by keyword title author. So just um, move. No, no, it's under number two um, where it says, um, was also suge suggested to put the publisher, production company right. and distributor in the key keyword oh. field. Okay. There and, is no keyword field there, and only was... in the regular search. Sorry, that was me, Dia, who suggested that keyword, and I thought we were going back and forth. I meant for our um, yes. on stage. Yes, due to I understand. Due to keyword. Yeah, right. but I see what I you're just, saying. It does look like the Z3950, and if I said that, that's not what I meant, and I apologize. No, I I I don't remember who did, but then I agreed because I wasn't thinking about that at that point. But anyway, I just thought it might be more clear in the minutes if we either remove that or clarify it one or the other perfect well i can remove that and then i can in that last line put when searching through the regular that would be that would be great okay. i All think right. it would be more clear thank you thank and, you welcome and this is kind of a separate but related issue um the keyword box shows up when you have the local catalog checked so it's only something that's available on our side um not searching other catalogs so that's why good point um that's why if you see the keyword box it means you've got the local catalog checked mm. um which is something we tend to discourage um just because of the chance of bringing in a record um from our own system that's already there um but just in case somebody has noticed it, I just wanted to point that out. Oh, can I say I had a really fun experience with that exact same thing. It wasn't necessarily a DVD, um, but it did. It says native evergreen right there next to the book. And if you do try to accident, if you accidentally poke the button import, it pops up a message that this um, this item is already in the catalog. That happened to me. Okay, well, that's good. Yeah, so that's good. Yeah, I was going to say I, it, it wouldn't let me because I was like, no, not that button. And then it said, you can't anyway. Ha ha ha. So I was <laughs> very good. Um, and Heather wrote in the chat, oh, that she keeps the local one visible to make sure she's not bringing in duplicate records. So everyone has their own system, but it's just good to be aware. So you don't poke the wrong button. So I will get that corrected in the minutes. Anything else that people uh, needed clarified or corrected they found? Not hearing anything, I would move that we accept the minutes as amended. Perfect, can I get a second? I second, Heather. Awesome. I Sorry, this is Tracy. I did notice that um, our adjournment time was an hour off. That's the only thing. It's very minor. Okay, make a note of that too. That's part of the amendment then, Tracy. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so we've uh, moved and approved the minutes with two corrections, which we will get updated and loaded up onto the web page. And on to member comments and questions. So does anybody have weird things they want to discuss, questions that have come up in this last month? Anything at all? Okay, if you think of something while we're going through, feel free to jump in. Um, I'll make a note of your question and we'll we'll get to it towards the end of the meeting, all right? 
I, I just thought of something, sorry. Um, can we talk about Oregon Blue Book? Sure. Do you want to just jump right into that now, Beth? I mean, um, no sure. Um, just a reminder that the uh, latest Oregon Blue Book is out and people are starting to add it to the system, um, that we have a combined bib for all the years. And so go ahead and attach your item to the, uh, the Oregon Blue Book bib and go ahead and add a part that indicates you have the 2122 version. If you have any questions, ask your mentor or email me. Um, be glad to help. Does anyone have a question about that? Well, we have Beth here. All right. Um, first item is there is a new official approved authorized genre for board books. So now you can use the 655 with the subfield two. And it does, if you can't remember exactly how it's supposed to look, it is in the authorized um, lists now. So it, it does search. I checked that before the meeting. Um, so that just came through a couple weeks ago. We just heard about that. Any questions on board books? that people have had cataloging them. No. All right. Well, then next, uh, fix field. So let me go into see. All right. So this is just a general Adult fiction, it's Outlander. And notice that the audience field here is blank, and that's what we want the general adult fiction to show an audience. If you use G, which now in the drop down it says general not to be used, if you do use G in that, then it will pop up in the children's opacs, which we want to avoid. Are there any questions about the audience fix field? No? Okay. Then this is a question for everyone. We kind of want to hear your thoughts on this. On the lit F fix field, generally have sage preference has been to use one for fiction, but we have noticed that F for novels has been showing up in records. And we were kind of wondering if people are seeing this on records that they are importing from Z39. I imported one from Seattle on Saturday that had an F and I changed it to one. But we're kind of wondering if you're seeing a trend in those records that you're importing. Has anyone noticed anything? This is Lori, and I, I have noticed more Fs. Uh, how does that affect our system? I'm sorry, I may have missed your introduction on this, Celine. So it affects the searching. Beth, do you want to go into the details so I don't get it wrong? Sure. Um, basically, um, it's only affects patrons who are narrowing their search down to a specific type of material. So if they had narrowed their selection down to fiction only, um, selecting the one, then they wouldn't see the novels. Um, now you do have the ability to select more than one option. So if you're thinking about it, you could select both one and F with the control button, um, with the control click, um, to select both of those and then both would show up in the search. So that's why we were recommending that folks uh, by default do the one so that if patrons 
search fiction, they would get more types. But novel is technically correct if it does mention novel on the books. So we're not saying it's it's not correct. We're just thinking about the searching. Has anybody noticed more records coming in with with F or one, or do you generally change them as they come in? I've noticed on short stories a lot of times and poetry are um, specified. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's a good thing to specify because that's often something we want to narrow down by. Um, you know, somebody's looking specifically for poetry, it's good that it's marked that way. And I'm trying to recall on Saturday, I was cataloging mostly manga. I think I just did a couple regular fiction, but it could have been a manga record that came up as an F. Uh, which I guess they were thinking graphic novel. I changed it to a one though, just so it was a broader. I do tend, tend to change all of the ones that I import from F to ones, if I do see it. As do I, and I actually see it quite a bit. I do the same, this is Sarah. I haven't, um, and I haven't really noticed an increase, but I have noticed the Fs occasionally. Um, I have a question, Beth, is it possible, you know, people do select in the search for literary form that draws from that field is it possible to change the search so that if they choose fiction it also searches things that have f's in that field does it make sense like it is does that complicated? make sense it might be complicated i'll have to look at yeah. the programming on the other end to see how easy it is um i was able yeah in some okay. cases i can other, I'll have to investigate. Yeah. I've been changing them to ones also because that makes the most sense to me. But I, um, I don't know. You know, it's a, it, it's definitely easy to miss too. So, yeah, and and we don't know how much patrons are using this mm -hmm. search at all. Um, so it may mm -hmm. not be a big deal um, because they're not bothering to limit down their search by literary form. So um, without some patron yeah. studies, I think it's hard to know. I was going to ask if there's a way within the system to see if and when that happens. I've never thought about it before. Hmm. I can look into that as well because I know that um, if we still have our web search statistics turned on, then I should be able to, to look at searches. And I don't know how easy that would be, but I'll make a note to try and figure out. This is Lori, and one thing I know here in Harney County that gets used often is trying to narrow down by juvenile fiction. And so I'm assuming that could also affect the thoroughness of that search. Um, no, because they're probably, well... That's probably in the subject heading uh, genre. No, it's actually, um, if they're using the group search that I created for the SAGE juvenile materials, that's based on shelving location, as is the shelving location when you narrow it down to your library. Those are all based on the shelving locations in your library, so it doesn't look at the fixed fields at all. No, we often people just add it to their keyword, say Pearl Harbor juvenile fiction. Uh, yeah. so. Oh, wow. And that works as long as it has the uh, Library Congress zero with juvenile fiction, but it does not return if you're using the Library Congress children's subject field. Correct. Doesn't That's correct. That yeah. No. Yeah. Hmm. It's almost like we have too many options.
Well, it's, you know, everybody, the patrons that I've helped use the catalog, everyone finds their own particular way that they like to search depending on the materials that they're looking for. Um, and I personally think more options is better because they might miss one and find it in a different way. Um, You know, a lot of it's just uh, as the patrons get used to using the catalog. And a lot of them just ask for help. Any other? So the, what I'm sensing is general consensus is if you see the lit F, it should probably be one. If you're seeing the word novel written on your book, it is not incorrect to go ahead and change that to novel, and you can certainly do it. And um, if the research is out there, best going to try to see how people are searching and if it's really having that much of an effect on things. And we'll let you know down the road if we find anything out about the, the patron searches. Any other questions or comments on the fixed fields or any other fixed field questions people have? This is Lori, and something I am seeing more of is that more of our utilities uh, on the C3950 seem to be adding ease for audience level, even if it's not um, kind of like mature E. I'm seeing that more and more in records. Anyone else? I have two, but I know that we actually do things a little differently with the ease than other systems do. Yeah, we're kind of going against the tide, folks. Um, yes, we are. Uh, but um, it seemed good at the time <laughs> we made the decision um, to have a way to identify these books. We, we are know. largely we are largely using E's almost like an R rating, um, which doesn't appear to be standard. Yeah. How does which, everybody else feel? Um, this is Sarah at Hood River, and I I've gotten some pushback from my adult selector about that. She's just she would like to know, you know, specifically well. <laughs> which books get the E? How do we know? How bad does it have to be? How violent? You know, how can you tell? <laughs> All these kind of things. And I and I don't really have a good answer for her. I'm not sure. You know, I, so I, I've been using it for obviously, you know, erotica or things like that. But I don't. Um, it does feel like there's potentially a lot of gray area. And it's also just potentially hard to know. I agree. So I'm just curious, this is John, I'm, I'm just curious if it's not used in that fashion and if instead it's used for uh, interest level, is that, is that the other way of doing it that we're seeing on Z39 import that we see ease for items that just are generally targeted toward adults? That's what I've understood from reading the stuff in OCLC about it. It's just, it's intended for adults. So isn't that just as subjective a decision as <laughs> deciding what is explicit? I mean, who makes that decision? I have to agree with Sarah, you know, when it says, I, I kind of like it as, and this, this is going to come out wrong no matter how I say it, but it's kind of like a mini warning system we can have. And, you know, if it does say erotica, if it does say um, erotic fiction or just other little clues that we as catalogers can use to give our, and it's not because we're trying to censor anything like that. We're trying to give our patron as much information as they need to choose a book, whether in person or on the catalog. So having some 
little tiny designator. No, it's not fail foolproof and it's not going to be fail safe. But maybe if it's something you can sit and watch with your grandmother or sit and read with your grandmother, everybody's grandma's different, but we're all going to have an inner gauge. But I do like having just a little a little warning system out there, not censured, just information wise. That's it's really that's only why something. We, that's why we originally chose to not put ease in everything. We wanted that as well, but we are going against the bigger world on this one at this point for sure. Yeah, I get that too. Well, this is something also that um, really only staff see. And we oh. remove the we remove the audience search. Oh. So the importance well, of us segregating this might not be as big a deal as we're thinking. I was, I was just going to ask: Do we have a way to search specifically for the adult, mature, explicit? I mean, are we even able to use it uh, as a patron if it's only staff? Yeah, we might be spinning wheels. Yeah, and, and making extra work for ourselves, changing all those E's that come in um, as we see them. Um, certainly, I could put the search back. Um, at the time, I think there was argumentation that um, we didn't really need that search or that it was more confusing or problematic for the patron? Well, I think part of it is the overlapping in the ages when you're looking at the A's through D's that, yeah. you know, it's just, it's, it's hard to break those out. And so if patrons just, uh, that's the part of conversation I remember. If patrons are looking for juvenile materials, they're not necessarily gonna look primary. You know, they're gonna just want juvenile. And so we were trying to simplify it for audience searches and that. Yeah. And that's why we we're in trying to encourage the use of the, the global searches that looked at shelving location. Mm -hmm. um, there's a note in chat from Lori. We've also long used the E on movies to indicate adult material in the true sense. <laughs> yeah, I'm over here on um, Overdrive right now, and they actually do have erotic literature as one of the subject searchable subjects in Library to Go. And if I remember correctly, that is actually a genre that's available as well. Um, there's a chat from Maribel. Uh, nonfiction for adults are categor categorized as quote unquote adult audience then question mark. Are nonfiction for adults categorized as adult? So what we had said before was nonfiction for adults was was blank is what we had been doing. Blank, yeah. I do have some, I catalog the adult graphics. Um, and so those oftentimes will very clearly have some type of content indication on them that will merit the E. Um, but uh, oftentimes um, they just end up being blank. I'm trying to think if I've come across a nonfiction book that isn't graphic that had some type of content indication on it. I can't remember that happening. But you don't restrict who can check those out, do you? No. We don't. No. no. So Beth, in the searching from the patron's perspective, not from staff, just from patrons, if we have a book that has blank in audience, and there is a parent over on the OPAC searching for, I don't know, what seemed like an innocent word, then 
none of the blanks are going to show up on the children's OPAC and none of the E's will show up on the children's OPAC. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So that's not a, f so either one of those keeps the children's OPAC working correctly. Yeah. Okay. That seems like the important part to me too, that if we can label and segregate that children's items, I don't know, it, it, feels, it feels kind of messy to me to try to use the E versus blank to differentiate adult items. But I mean, I, I can see the desire to do it and um, maybe it's worth a try, but it is, it's hard to search like you guys were talking about and, and the, when that field is available, I think it's, it's kind of confusing. <laughs> it's not totally clear the differentiation, so. So the kids, um, so the kids deal, the kids, um, uh, oh, uh, elements in that field seem like the most important to me. Right. I agree. I'm just wondering with the current trend of a lot of folks putting E in for just general adult interest materials, whether we want to back off on our use for this as adult, mature adult explicit. And instead, if we're trying to narrow down um, a search use, a genre or subject. Like if somebody's specifically looking for these, um, these type of materials. That makes sense to me to rely more on the subject and genre headings. These may not be particularly helpful, but on OCLC's um, audience fixed field page, the description for E is simply the item is intended for adults. And the example that they've given is a book with the title, How to Start a Business Without Any Money. Um, so that would, that would, that would be just, you know, something out in your everyday normal nonfiction collection. The G general says the item is of general interest and not aimed at an audience of a particular intellectual level. And then the blank just says the target audience for the item not known or not specified. Not that OCLC is the final arbiter, but that's just the uh, terms and examples they're using. Well, and a lot of folks do follow OCLC guidelines, so um, I don't want to take up too much time in discussion over this, but I'm kind of leaning towards maybe we don't um, specify mature adult explicit in the E. Rely on Just the subjects of, and genres. Yeah, I rely on the subjects and genre for that, um, especially since we've removed the audience search and unless we decide to bring that back, um, we're going to be getting lots of records coming in from C39 with E in there um, and expecting everybody to remember to change it, um, I think is, is putting us at a disadvantage as well. That makes sense. And especially if people are referring, I know I refer to OCLC all the time. I just have it pulled up when I'm cataloging. So well, how about this? Let's add this to the mentor meeting. Other catalogers, if you go back and you talk to your fellow cataloging staff and someone has a firm opinion in any direction, please email me and let's kind of just see how people feel about it um, and not take up too much more time today so we can get through the next part of the meeting and still get us out of here at noon. Does that sound all right to everyone? Email me if you hear strong feelings on 
the E in the blank for adult and or trying to categorize mature materials, whether it's important or not. That sounds good. Um, moving on, Heather, uh, update on cataloging classes if people are, are looking for those in the future. Um, I've been talking with Shoshana from Nebraska, and we've been going through her Mark 21 class. Um, she's set to start classes in Nebraska soon. So I'm hoping that will give us the opportunity <laughs> to also um, start sending people that direction to take these classes. Other than that, um, sorry, the phone is ringing. Heather, did she say when her first class is? That might give us an idea of time frame. She didn't. And I haven't okay. gotten an email back from her in about a week, though I know things have been stressful on her end. Um, okay. I, I'm not going to lie. I am going through and making a copy of what she has right now, just for posterity. Yes. Well, good. <laughs> for us, um, in yeah. case we need it. So we'll have that at least. And she does a pretty good job. It's pretty basic. So I feel like with this information, plus the sage specific practices that we'll be having, um, people shouldn't really have a problem going from cat three to cat two. Okay, yeah, and I was just gonna clarify that this class is mainly for, for those who are, are wanting um, to upgrade to cat two status, especially we've got a lot of new catalogers who have to kind of get some training and, and pass the cat two test before they get those permissions. So yeah, we're, we're anxious and thanks Heather for <laughs> pursuing this with the University of Nebraska. It's gonna make a big difference once, once it's set up. Yeah, it'll be good. And I'm assuming when we do get dates, you guys will just uh, send those out over email to everybody so they can just watch for them, right? Yeah. Um, so yes, once we get a date, um, the, this class is also in the Moodle environment. I don't know whether that's um, a, a environment that folks are familiar with, but um, you can establish a login and and do the class at your own pace, right, Heather? Yes, and it's all, and she changed all the questions, so it's nothing that is having to be graded by an instructor, so it's cool. pretty immediate. Okay. Great. All right, I'll look forward to the classes. Those are always fun. And anyone have a question about classes? Any information they need to know? This is Lori. I was just curious how many people are kind of waiting, Beth. Oh gosh, I'd have to go back through my email. Yeah, um, I think. Because we're Maybe also going to have one in here too soon. What do you mean? Oh yes, yeah. you'll have some new, new people too, yes. Um, I would guess six to 10, but if I go through all my contacts, maybe more. Okay. Yeah, it's, yeah. I, I appreciate everyone being patient. I know this has been a long haul and I really appreciate Heather and Beth putting this together. It's really needed, but I appreciate everyone waiting for their patience as well. Yeah, and, and a reminder again for those who are waiting, um, we're willing to help you get records in the system because we know it's not fair <laughs> that you can't, don't have this class available to you right right this minute. Um, and like Lori said, thanks for being patient. All right. Library, of, did you want me to show this, Beth? I've got the library of things up next. Yes, I'm glad you're showing it. <laughs> um, I was going to refer to it if you didn't. 
So this is a document that we put together for some recommended practices for Library of Things, um, just to provide some consistency in our records. Um, obviously, just like Library of Things is a unique um, element, and in libraries, it's it's kind of challenging to catalog them, and there's differences um, that you just have to account for. So I haven't put this up on the Sage um, Lib website yet, but it's going to go up there um, as a guide for folks to print out. Um, I don't know whether we would just want to step through these or what's your thought? Yeah, why don't you just go through and then if people um, have questions, they can jump in and we can just get them clarified and it's working through it. Okay. So have have we talked before about what library things are? You know, that's what you guys wanted to, wanted to point out. The notes I have say that library things is, are the items that are so unusual or unique that they don't fit into regular formats. And then the questions to ask, it would help you determine if they are like, do you want them to go through ILL? Do you want them to have holds and renewals? How long do you want them to check out? How will patrons search for them in the catalog? Kind of those, all those questions will help you determine whether it's a library of things or if it's just a kit or an item. Okay. So um, for library of things, um, we've got things like cake pans, we've got mixers, sewing machines, um, in some senses games um, that you want to check out. They're, they're things that are not your typical book, audiobook, um, DVD type of thing. Um, they're unique. Most often you want to keep them local um, just because they're things that can't be sent through the career. So for a library of things, we um, generally want folks to use the mark type R, um, which is for object realia. Um, even if it's kit-like, say there's multiple things included along with the item, it just helps us achieve consistency um, in the look of the record and, and searching. Um, including the name of the library in square brackets after the title um, to more easily identify who it belongs to. Um, right now we're recommending separate bibs for each library. Um, so if you have the same cake pan, <laughs> um, Hood River's cake pan would be different than Harney County's cake pan. Um, and this just allows the patrons to find their local cake pan more easily. Um, also suggesting using a 246 for additional access points for the patron. And this would be something like Library of Things or Hood River Library of Things, or maybe just different ways to search for a particular item. Um, so use this as much as you think um, for additional titles that the patron may use to search for it. Um, use the 250 for things like the model number, um, because that might um, be important to differentiate. Um, we're recommending using the 264 second indicator three for a manufacturer, just because the number one for publisher um, doesn't seem to fit these items. Um, but obviously use your catalog or judgment if you don't think it's really a manufacturer, you obviously can change that. Um, utilizing inch measurements in the 300 if um, you feel it's preferable for your patrons, it's allowable. Um, not including a separate 33X for pamphlets, leaflets, or instructions, just because they're not really, yes, they're a part of the item, but um, we don't necessarily want a book icon to show up for a little pamphlet. And that's what the additional 33X for um, text um, would, would do. Um, choose the 999 that most cl closely matches the item. Um, and those in the template 
that you see uh, the create mark template those are the ones that um, they're just an example um, your item might not match that at all but make sure you include the subfield F LOT on the 999 um, which allows searching by item type library of things so it's an index um, that can help search and find these items Okay, when cataloging the items, circulation modifiers, library of things, and library of things renew can be used to help drive the circulation and hold policy. But if you want that to happen, we have to know what those circulation and hold policies um, are for your library. And so you need to coordinate with us to, to get those policies in for you, and we're happy to do that. So any questions? Oh, I guess I want to add along with the recommended practices. Um, we're also going to give some example um, bibliographic records for you to look at just to give you a guide um, or a starting point um, as to some records that are already in the system um, that meet these criteria. Questions? Would it be helpful for me to pull up your template, Bez? Um, you can. Did we? I think we brought it up last time, though. It, yeah, I think we did. Let's see. Because we were talking about the templates. Right. It's up. Yeah, there you go. There we go. Most of it on the screen there. Does anyone have so any questions? This gets, Sorry. Yeah. No, I'm just going to say that it just gives a starting point for the record. Um, some things you can fill in. Uh, I just have a question. I thought I'd pull the smart people in the room and, and ask does anybody know offhand if there are any uh, sub? divisions that are appropriate to this type of purpose you know is there like a subfield v not library of things but like library applications or something does anybody know any offhand that they've used i'll go look after this meeting's over i was just curious if anybody knew offhand i think it's such an evolving area i i don't know that they've they've created one yet john but i'd be happy to be corrected if if somebody finds one out there i think the most i see is like a miscellaneous so yeah if you're going to do Excuse a can then what is your 650 I haven't ever cataloged any library of things, so I'm I'm just. Uh, I don't tend to use yeah. subfield V's when I do library yeah, of I things just, stuff. Mm -hmm. I've just been doing the subfield A. So, I'm sorry. What was the question again about the which field are you talking about? The fixed fields. No, Where, I, we're actually. I would... Yeah, I was asking about subject headings. I was just curious if there was any any particular subdivision for for this type of library of things application. <laughs> it seems very specific. I don't. This is Sarah, and I've I've done a lot of these records now, and I do not know of a specific subheading. I'm a little. Um, that does not mean that there isn't, but I the the sources that I've checked the most are. Um, there's a Hillsborough Public Library, or um, is that the name? Anyway, it's um, they have added a lot of things, and they have someone who focuses on it exclusively to check their um, check their records. And then we have access to OCLC Connection, and I always look in there and see what other people have put. But it, I have not seen any regular use of it or any like really specific guidelines of specific um, subdivisions, and even the 
the subject headings, I'll choose, I'll try to find things that, that will help bring patients to bear patrons to the record, but I don't, I will use them kind of loosely. I mean, obviously they're, they're uh, more, they're designed for content, you know, things, what they're about, which right. is rarely applicable with the library of things is more tends to be what they are. So I'm looking at a, a record I just, I recently did for a little uh, uh, CD and, and tape player boombox. And I put in subheadings for sound recordings and music, which is not quite appropriate, but I also wanted to find those things. I mean, they're real subject headings, but they're not genre headings or they're not. So anyway, if we do find better resources for this, I'm glad to incorporate them, but I have not found very, I, it really seems to be just adapting just to and adapt as well as you can to make things findable and um, describable so patrons know what they're looking at when they look at the record. Does that make sense? Yeah, that feels yeah. right. I mean, that's what we do too. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, there was one thing that was mentioned at the mentor meeting, which maybe everyone always already knows, but I did not is that if you are using these templates and you decide not to use one of the fields, um, so say you don't want the 300 subfield E, if you do not type anything in that, that subfield will go away. Uh, you don't have to manually delete it. Uh, however, um, they, uh, Beth did include punctuation in the 264 and 300 here. So if you decide not to use one of those subfields, you need to delete that punctuation so that that subfield will go away. Otherwise, it's going to have a still have a semicolon sitting in there, right, Beth? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. So those are options for you. You don't need to use them all if it doesn't fit with the item that you're trying to catalog. Any other? Um, Library of Things questions. It's 1150. We had one more thing to talk about. So we're on track, but I don't want to cut it off if people have questions for, for Beth or other points to discuss. I just wanted to say thank you for everybody that's been involved in putting together the recommendations and just kind of overall the Library of Things, because I know there's a lot of people that have been waiting for it. So thank you, everyone. Yes, definitely. It's a lot of work. It'd be very helpful to have this for people. Um, next, we have go back to our agenda really quickly. And oh, um, demoing the Angular catalog, Beth. How would you like? Do you want me to give you the screen? Um, I think you can just bring it up on yours. Um, basically, we're just showing folks how they can look at um, the new Angular catalog. Um, and the Angular just means it's a new way of programming the software. Um, when we actually get to upgrade, um, we'll, the cataloging interface will have a new look. And so, I'm sorry, Beth, I can't remember how to get there. Okay, under cataloging. Do you see staff catalog experimental? Yes. Okay. Um, and it is experimental, so there are some things that don't work. <laughs> um, so I wouldn't use this exclusively um, to do your cataloging, but it does give you um, a taste of maybe what some of the new things are going to look like. Um, so just a different, the functionality is, is all there. Um, it's just, it's a new look mainly. So this looks the same, and it's probably because of our 
templates um, that I've got set up. So pretty much just in the cataloging portion then, like the back end that looks yeah. different? Yeah, yeah. And um, when we actually go to, um, when we're getting closer to the actual upgrade and migration, I'm going to be doing some trainings. And I thought about doing some side-by-side -side comparisons of, of what a record looks like um, right now versus what it's going to look like in the Angular version. Um, you could try doing a search right now. And while Celine's doing that, I might just mention that <clears throat> when Beth first showed this to the mentors, the thing that I noticed about it is if you do um, Cat Express records and import them, that interface is very similar to what the Angular is going to be. Yeah. Um, so I've gotten used to it because they're bringing in um, importing records either through Cat Express or other vendors. Um, a little bit and you know some of the tabs have different names um, you can see this catalog looks the search results looks a lot different doesn't it yeah now some of this if we end up not liking certain features of it um, given time I could probably programmatically change some of this because they do allow you to customize um, customize the the OPAC display and there's a new way of handling um, the OPEC search results but you can see the same information is there it just looks a little different And one thing um, that I've heard, um, just listening to people that have changed to a new version that we haven't yet, um, when you first come, you'll notice that item table, it's not the OPAC yeah. view. And that has been a frustration for some folks. So it is it gonna has. take some time to get used to just kind of the layout being a little different too. So it's gonna take us all some time to kind of rethink our patterns a bit. What's the time frame yeah. on this, Beth? I apologize if I missed it earlier. No, um, we don't really have a time frame. Um, mm -hmm. What we have to do next is set up a test server um, because of the software being so different. They want us to um, move all of our data to a test server to make sure that there's no issues um, with our local setup. Um, and John George is working with EOU. He's going to be visiting um, there shortly, hopefully, um, to set up our old servers um, with some software so that we can get the test server set up. So that's the next thing uh, goal-wise that we're, we're working on is getting the test server set up so that we can do a test migration um, and then we'll have an idea of what the date can be for the actual migration. Got it. Can we all take a moment to bask in the glory that there's only one Jane Austen listing? <laughs> Let's look at the type. Oh, no, no, don't. don't okay. Fine. It's not there. <laughs> yeah, <sorry> about it. <laughs> Normally we would see Jane, you know, the Austin Jane with no date and, you know, three or four mm -hmm. entries there or J.A. Austin or anyway, it was just really nice right there. Everybody's all together. Mm -hmm. The the joy of authority work. Yes. <laughs> it's going to be my autobiography. <laughs> the John Brockman story, the joy of authority <laughs> work. <laughs> I don't want to catalog it. It sounds like a self-published book. And I don't think anybody wants to read it either. <laughs> okay, any other? Know, John, John, that sounds like adult material. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice. 
Um, any other questions? We're coming right up at noon. And if there, there's a note to please, if you're interested in moving to a different cataloging level, contact John Brockman at cataloger at bakerlib.org or your mentors, and those lists are on the uh, Sage webpage. Are there any other questions, things that people have thought of in the last hour that they are dying to ask or share? This is a really odd question, but I, I have not noticed this before. Sitting here, it says Viz Disk. With the push to change everything from abbreviations, it's funny that the system would do that. What do you Where like are you more? seeing the, the physical yeah. description? Uh -huh. Oh, under yes. under the listing below right. the icon. Oh, those are labels that Evergreen. I know, has but isn't that funny? That yes. yeah, it is. I'm Just I'm wondering whether catalogers pointed that out to the programmers, and maybe it's changed in a new a later version, because we're. There's been several versions of this software that have come out. Um, Good point. So our ex our experimental view is that is it is just that, and it, it's there's four. Yeah, because they're they have three point eight out right now. Um, so yeah, there's four other versions um, since then. So I'll have to look and see what the the latest catalog looks like but that would be something we would be correcting if uh, um, if it was still in that form when we migrated but you're right yeah it's kind of a anomaly mm -hmm. anything else kind of a sore thumb look <laughs> sore thumb look yeah well, and the print thing always gets me and it randomly pops up in our regular catalog. Off to the side and down below. Off the side, down below, and I've stopped looking for it anymore. I just accept it and move on, but that always throws me. Yeah. I'll have to look and see if I can remove it because I don't think we need to see it. It's drawing it from another field, and I'm trying to remember what that field was. Mm. All right. Well, in the interest of ending on time today, it's noon. So uh, let's see. Will someone move to adjourn the meeting? And let me also say, if you guys think of any questions that you have um, any time during the month, just fire me off an email, and I'll keep a running list, and we can talk about them at the next meeting. And mentor meeting if needed. So please don't hesitate to send your questions on. And with that, will someone move to adjourn? Thanks, Celine. Yeah, we'll, we'll adjourn. Move to adjourn. Thank you. And a second. Second. All right. It's noon and we're out of here. Everyone have a fantastic Monday. It's going to be a good day. It really is. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Yep. Thank you Take for coming. Take care, everybody.